Welcome to The Straight Stitch, a podcast about sewing and other fiber arts. This is episode 16, and my name is Janet Zabo. I will be your guide as we explore all things sewing. I am still working on getting over whatever virus it was I picked up after Christmas. I wasn't terribly sick, but it seems to be taking longer than I would like to bounce back, and that's a bit frustrating. I will tell you that six years ago in 2018, I got the flu in February and I was sick for about a week and I ended up in the ICU on a ventilator for a week. I don't remember anything about that week because I was medically sedated and in a coma. It, it, that one took a while to bounce back from too. It was about two months before I felt completely normal after that. Um, Thankfully, I had great doctors and nurses, and I was able to uh, get out of the hospital fairly quickly and get back on my feet. I tend to be pretty careful now when respiratory stuff comes around because I certainly don't want to repeat that, that experience. It wasn't one of the more fun experiences of my life. I want to go over a few housekeeping things real quickly. Um, I have moved the podcast to its own website. The podcast had its own domain name, but I had everything under janetzabo.com because I wasn't quite sure uh, how well the podcast was going to do, how quickly it was going to grow. And that was a good way for me to get started and try to organize um, the things that I'm doing. But it's pretty apparent now that the podcast needs its own website. So it is now under its own website. You can find it by searching the straight stitch podcast.com or typing that into your address bar. You can also get to it from the homepage of janetzabo.com. There's a link that goes right to the straight stitch podcast website. It probably won't make a huge difference to listeners, but in terms of my organization and housekeeping, it's going to be much easier to have the podcast on its own website. If you go there, there is a little menu bar on the left hand side of the screen where you can type in your email address and get automatic updates when a new episode is posted, if that's something that you'd like to do there. This has been a week of paperwork for me. The first week of the year is almost always like that. I think I made my accountant laugh a little bit because we were talking about tax preparation and he said, well, let me know when you've reconciled the bank statements through the end of 2023. And I emailed him back and I said, I reconciled the December bank statement at 6 a.m. on New Year's Day. So that's all done. Um, I am a little neurotic about tracking pennies here because of um, the fact that we own a construction company. And I like to know what the financials are for the construction company, so I keep a pretty close eye on that. I'm also on the board for our local Homestead Foundation. I'm the head of the fundraising committee, and we have a monthly meeting at the beginning of every month, and I'm also getting information compiled for our board meeting that's coming up. So it's been a lot of paper shuffling and organization and moving things around, but I finally feel like I've got most of that cleared off my desk and I can get back to doing some sewing. I started making a baby quilt. It may end up actually being more than one baby quilt because I'm having a lot of fun picking fabrics. And when I start choosing fabrics for a quilt and slicing and dicing, sometimes I get carried away and I end up with enough for more than one quilt. So we'll see. I I need to make one quilt for a gift but I may end up just doing two at the same time. Clothing manufacturing has been set aside for a week or two. I needed a break. I did get yesterday in yesterday's mail, I did uh, receive a package from Minerva, Minerva minerva.com. They're a UK based company, so I don't order from them a lot, but every so often I'll treat myself and order some fabric. And this particular batch of fabric contained a couple of yards of the meat milk ottoman rib fabric and there's a little bit of a story behind that 
I'm trying to hunt down a knitting pattern. I thought I had it at one point and I can't find it from about 20, 25 years ago, maybe, uh, that was in a publication called Knitting Now. And it was for an ottoman rib sweater. And the ottoman rib was a knit pearl pattern and it was a horizontal rib. And I cannot find instructions for an ottoman rib fabric anywhere for a hand knitted ottoman rib. Ottoman rib is fairly common, common, maybe not be the right word. You can find it in machine knitting books. You can find it in machine knitting patterns. So I was curious to see what Meat Milk was calling an ottoman rib and the fabric came yesterday and it's what I would call a horizontal tuck stitch um, that makes horizontal ribs on the fabric. So in terms of structure, it's not the same as what I'm remembering being the hand knitted version, but the fabric is gorgeous and it's probably going to end up being a um, some kind of a cardigan. I also got a couple of yards of the Minerva Core Range Cotton Lycra French Terry in the colorway Celestial Motion. And this is, is just gorgeous. And I think it's going to end up being a Natalie top. The, I talked about the Jaylee Natalie last week and how much I like that cowl neckline. And I think this French Terry is going to become another Natalie cowl neck top. So I haven't abandoned clothing sewing completely, but I needed to do something different and I have to make this baby quilt. So this seemed like a good opportunity to get back to doing some quilting for a while. In today's episode, I want to talk about sewing machine needles. They're such a tiny part of the whole process, but they're such a huge part of the whole process. And I think it's important to go over needles and why you might want to choose a particular needle. Needle sizes, needle systems can be utterly confusing at times. So we're going to start at the top and work our way down and see if we can untangle some of this. If you've been sewing long enough, you may remember that it used to be that you bought needles in one of two flavors. You either bought red band needles or you bought yellow band needles. Uh, red band needles were for wovens and yellow band needles were for knits. And those were basically the two categories that needles fell into. Nowadays, needles come in a huge variety of flavors, depending on what kind of thread you're using, what kind of fabric you're sewing on. So we, we will be exploring all of those different and new kinds of needles that are available to modern sewists. Let's start by looking at the anatomy of a sewing needle. I really do find this fascinating. I find it equally fascinating that inventors in the 1800s were able to come up with the sewing machine as we know it and come up with a system that creates the lock stitch in the fabric, even though it really doesn't resemble hand sewing all that much. And a few of the early machines used curved needles. Some industrial machines still use curved needles, but for the home sewist, we are most familiar with the straight needle. So let's look at it, if you can imagine in your mind, although I will put links to relevant articles in the show notes, um, or grab a, grab a sewing needle if you have one near you. If you look at the top, that's called the butt, the butt end of the sewing needle, and it's kind of beveled a little bit. And the butt end is what you would see if you have a little window on your sewing machine or your serger, where when you insert the needle, you can see that the needle is seated all the way up into the needle uh, position. And that butt will be up at the top. Just below that, we have the shank. And the shank is the straight part of the needle. On home sewing machines, one side of it is going to be flat, which makes it very easy to insert the needle into your sewing machine. Usually your manual will tell you to insert the needle with the flat part facing the back. Although on some machines, 
it may be facing the side. I know that on my Neki BF, which is about, oh, 70 some years old, it's a vintage Italian sewing machine. It has a side loading bobbin and the flat part of the shank faces to the right. And I noticed that on um, other machines, if they happen to have a side loading bobbin, the shank usually faces to the right. If you have a top loading or a front loading bobbin, the shank will face toward the back. People who sew on domestic machines have a distinct advantage over people who sew with industrial sewing machines just from the standpoint that industrial sewing machine needles don't have a flat part of the shank. The entire shank is round and you have to be very careful about how you insert the needle into the machine to make sure that the eye is lined up where it needs to be and other parts of the needle are where they need to be to work properly. It's a little bit tricky, but eventually you get the hang of putting those needles in. Below the shank is the shoulder, and that's the portion where the needle narrows down and becomes the blade, which is the longest part of the needle, usually. Um, the blade terminates in the point, and along the blade there will also be a groove that carries the thread as well as an eye into which the thread passes. On the side of the needle opposite the groove, you'll find a little indentation near the eye of the needle, and that's called the scarf. And the purpose of the scarf is to provide a place for the bobbin hook to pass through to carry the bobbin thread and to lock, to allow the bobbin thread to lock with the upper thread. So that's the purpose of the scarf. Again, on domestic machines, because they have that flattened shank, the needle goes in in one position and stays there. On an industrial machine, you can tweak the position of that scarf a little bit. And sometimes you'll hear people say that they um, adjust the position of the needle slightly to angle that scarf one way or the other, rather than having it be straight on. Um, that's probably a little more technical than you want, but if you're using an industrial machine, that might make a difference to you. Needle coatings are becoming um, more and more of a consideration. Typically, uh, sewing machine needles were nickel plated. That's been around since the mid 1800s and it's still the most common plating. You might now see needles that say that they are chrome plated. Schmetz needles have a special category of needles that they call chrome plated. My friend Tara and I took a class at Sew Expo last year from Rhonda Pierce, who is a, an educator for Schmetz needles. And she made the comment that they're going to start chrome plating all of their needles. And we're still trying to verify that, but I've heard pros and cons to that. Chrome plating makes them a little harder, but the problem with hard needles, extra hard needles, is that if you happen to run a needle into the needle plate or you break a needle while you're sewing, it's possible that because the needle is so much harder, it could throw your machine out of time that much easier. So there, again, I said there's some pros and cons to that. Some people are excited about having chrome needles and some people are not excited about having chrome needles. You might also see needles that say they have a titanium finish or a ceramic finish or a non-stick finish. And again, those would be specialty needles for certain applications. Like the non-stick needles are great for when you're sewing through vinyl. I think that part of what makes choosing a sewing machine needle so complicated sometimes is because there are so many numbers on the package. Um, it is hard to determine what size needle you need or what kind of needle you need. And there really was no standardization of sewing machine needles until about the mid-1940s, I think. Um, so choosing a needle is 
requires a little bit of education. It requires a lot of cross-referencing sometimes of uh, needle system charts. I have a needle system chart for vintage machines that is an entire page of an Excel spreadsheet in very small print because my Necky BV industrial machine, technically the needle size that that machine used isn't made anymore, but I was able to cross-reference it and find a different machine, a different numbering system and figure out what needle size I could still get to use in that machine. It is also possible if you work on a machine to do what's called retiming of the machine. And what that means is that you are changing the stroke of the needle bar to use a different size needle. So let's say you can't find the needles that you need anymore for your vintage sewing machine. You can retime your machine by moving the needle bar so that you can use a readily available needle. And I have retimed machines. It's not complicated, but it's not easy either. And you have to be fairly particular about how you're doing it. Um, and I've only done it on a straight stitch machine. So um, it's possible to do it. People who want to use their vintage sewing machines will do it if that means that they can use a machine for which a needle system isn't available anymore. Thankfully, home sewing machines take the same needle system. You'll see it listed as 130-705 HAX1 or 15X1, and those numbers just depend on which manufacturer is making the, the needle. My, I'm looking at my at the pack of organ needles for my Necky BV industrial sewing machine, which just happens to sit here in my office next to me. And that needle system is D as in David, B as in boy, X1. But it also cross references with needle system 16, X231 and 16, X257. So that's why I said for some of those vintage machines, you need to have the cross referencing chart to know what needles you can, you can use in your machine. There is one additional needle system that is used by sergers and cover stitch machines, and that is the ELX705. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, those aren't needles that you would wanna use in a home sewing machine, but they're typically found in serger and cover stitch applications. Usually right near or underneath the needle system designation on a package of needles, you will find the needle size. And this is usually two sets of numbers that are separated by a slash. So you might see 75 slash 11 or 80 slash 12 or 90 slash 14. Those two numbers are, they're both put there because one system has been in use forever and the other system is metric. So the width of the needle, actually the width of the needle blade is expressed in millimeters. So for a needle that is designated a 100 needle, that means that the needle blade width is one millimeter. If it's a 75 needle, that means that the needle blade width is 0.75 millimeters. The other number is the Singer needle size and that system's been around forever so they still include it on the package. But typically when you're looking for a, a needle size to use on a project, you're going to be looking at those two numbers, the ones that are separated by the slash. So how do you know which is the correct size needle to use for a particular project? I would say that in my years of sewing, I very rarely venture much outside the 8012s or the 9014s when it comes to sewing on my domestic machine. If I'm doing something with a very lightweight fabric, like a cotton lawn, I might go down to a 7511. Um, if I'm doing denim, I may go up to 100 slash 16. When I started sewing on my Juki industrial machine, 
I was in for a real treat because some of those needles are so thick that the sizing goes up to 23 for sewing heavier vinyls and leathers. And those needles look like small spears. But in general, for domestic sewing, 8012s and 9014s are going to be the most common size. And that's true whether you're sewing on a domestic sewing machine or you're using a serger or cover stitch. Some of what size needle you choose will also be dictated by what kind of thread you're using. If you're using a 100 weight thread, for example, you could use an 8012 needle or even a 7511 needle. If you are using a 40 weight thread, a heavier thread, you're going to need the larger eye and you'll get that in the 9014 needle or 116 needle. Um, if, you're, if you try to use a needle that's got too small an eye for the thread that you want to use, you'll know that because the thread will just start shredding. It won't be able to go back and forth through the needle eye. And thread typically passes through the eye of the needle approximately 30 times before it actually gets into the fabric to make the stitch. That's just from the process of the thread feeding back and forth through the machine. So you can see that if you have an eye that's too small for the thread, the wear and tear on that thread as it's going back and forth 30 times through the eye of the needle will cause the thread to start shredding. What about those ELX 705 needles? These are an interesting beast. I've seen some information that the EL designation means Elna because these were at one time designed for Elna sergers. I, I haven't verified that. I do know that the Schmetz website has some information about the ELX 705 needles and they note that the needle has a groove on both the front and the back of the needle. So on regular sewing machine needles, you'll only have a groove on the front of the needle. The ELX 705 needles have a groove on the front and the back. And cover stitch machines usually, I, I want to say almost always, require an ELX 705 needle. You can use an ELX 705 needle in a serger, but you can also use a domestic sewing machine needle in most sergers, not all of them. So don't go telling everybody that Janet told you you could use a regular sewing machine needle. There are some older vintage sewing or vintage sergers that require special needles. Let's talk about needle points. Remember when I said that in the olden days you either got yellow band needles or red band needles and the red band needles were for wovens because they had a sharp point and the yellow band needles were ball point or rounded needles and they were designated for knits. And the reason you'd want to use a rounded needle for a knit is because you don't want the sharp point of the needle breaking that thread in the fabric because then it would start to unravel. Whereas a rounded point is going to actually go between the threads and not cut them. I would say within the last maybe five to 10 years though, uh, needle engineering has progressed to the point where there are several different subtypes of needles and needle points. And so we're just gonna go over all of those one by one. The universal needle is what I have heard described as a hybrid between the sharp point needle and the ballpoint needle. When I teach serger classes, I will tell people that if they don't know what needle to use on the fabric that they're serging, a universal needle is a good place to start. A universal needle will work on virtually every fabric. And if it doesn't work, then that's when you probably should start looking at more specialty needles. But for all purpose, general purpose sewing on both my serger and my sewing machine now, I will use universal needles. The great thing is that Schmetz sells them in bulk packs of 100. Um, this is not meant to be a Schmetz advertisement, but I use Schmetz needles in my 
domestic machines, I tend to use Groats Beckert in my industrial machines because they're easier. Those are the easiest brand for me to find for the industrials that I've got. But for my domestic machines, I tend to use the Schmetz needles. They've got a great reputation. They've always held up well. You can't go wrong investing in a bulk pack of universal needles in size 8012 and universal needles in size 9014. Those will get you probably through 90% of your sewing projects. Schmetz still makes what they call a jersey or a ballpoint needle. And again, if you're sewing knits, um, and you aren't getting good results with a universal needle, switch to a jersey needle. Um, I think that you will find that that will help. Schmetz also makes now what is called a stretch needle. And you might be asking yourself, well, what's the difference between a jersey needle and a stretch needle? They're both ballpoint needles. Why would you choose one over the other? And my answer to that is the stretch needles seem to be aimed at sewing on fabrics that have lycra or spandex in them. Um, I ran into this doing a project where I was trying to do a lettuce edge on a lycra spandex fabric on my serger. And what kept happening was the stitching was falling off the edge of the fabric. So I switched to a stretch needle and the problem went away. And I think it was because that particular fabric was a rayon spandex and so it had a fair bit of spandex in it. If you look on the Schmetz website, they indicate that their stretch needles have a medium ballpoint, a smaller eye, and a deeper scarf. These are intended to be used on highly elastic knits, especially if the fiber content includes lycra, spandex, or elastic. I keep a supply of both, and if a jersey needle isn't doing the job for me, I'll switch to a stretch needle. Let's look at the specialty needles. The first specialty needle that you might use would be an embroidery needle. This one has a light ballpoint, a wide eye, and a wide groove, and that those features are intended to help the thread feed properly. You use them with rayon, polyester, and other specialty embroidered embroidery threads. There's also a gold embroidery needle, which is similar, but it's got a titanium nitride coating on it. And again, these are, these are Schmetz needles. The titanium coating resists adhesive, so if you've got any kind of a stabilizer underneath, and it improves the wear of the needle and penetration of the fabric. So if you think of embroidery projects where that needle is going in and out of the fabric at a very high rate of speed, um, multiple times, thousands of times, you want a needle that's going to stand up to that kind of abuse. And the titanium nitride ones are probably a good bet there. The jeans and denim needles are obviously for heavier, thicker fabrics, um, upholstery, but I've also, seen people use them for quilting and that's because a jeans or a denim needle has a reinforced blade which makes it much stronger um, and less prone to breaking. So if you are quilting through multiple layers um, you can see why using a jeans or a denim needle might be a good choice. These are great for bag making although um, I would caution you that if you're making bags on a domestic machine, watch. And if you start to get broken needles, then perhaps you're doing projects that require an industrial machine. So don't push your machines farther than they're intended to go. A leather needle actually has a specialty point on it. It isn't a point that makes a rounded hole in the fabric. Um, a leather needle actually makes a small cut in the fabric. So you would probably only want to use that needle if you were indeed sewing on leather or possibly vinyl. The metallic needle is great for people who like to use metallic threads. It's got a very elongated eye that helps to keep those threads from shredding and losing their integrity as they're passing through the machine. Um, I'm tempted to try these on my serger when I'm using 
like the 12 weight Glamour thread from Wonderfill. Um, even though I haven't had any problem with the thread shredding yet, I'm wondering if using a metallic needle would uh, help that situation. So that's something that I'm, I might be experimenting with. One of the needles that I know that quilters have gotten quite fond of recently are the Microtex needles. They have an extremely sharp point. So if you are doing any kind of precision piecing, the Microtex needles are a great choice, especially if you combine them with a fine thread, like maybe an 80 weight thread or even a 100 weight thread. I do know that the Microtex needles will tend to get duller faster. And we're gonna talk about needle, changing needles in a minute. Um, but you wanna, if you're using a Microtex needle, you wanna listen for when that needle sounds like it's starting to get dull and change it. And that will probably be more often than you would expect. When I'm free motion quilting or doing ruler work quilting on my Bernina Q20, I will typically use quilting needles. They just seem to give me a good result. There's nothing really special about them. They're not fancy like the metallic needles. There's a special taper for the slightly rounded point, and they're made especially for piecing and machine quilting. Schmetz also has a super nonstick needle, and if, you're, if you work with vinyl or you work with um, any kind of adhesive, underneath your uh, any kind of adhesive stabilizer or anything like that if you're doing applique um, you may want to use the super nonstick needle that's got a special anti-adhesive coating an extra large eye a distinctive scarf shape and a reinforced blade to prevent skipped stitches and to eliminate residue building up on the needle uh, spray adhesive, fusibles, vinyl, hook and loop tape, those are the places that you're going to want to use a super nonstick needle. And then finally, the top stitch needle. The top stitch needle is great when you are doing decorative top stitching on something. Think bags. Um, if you use it with a straight stitch plate on your machine, you can get perfectly straight stitch lines and even stitches for nice decorative effects on bags and things like that. Some of the Schmetz needles that I've talked about also come in twin needle or triple needle versions. It's best to maybe check on the Schmetz website and see what's available. They've also got ones, and I have yet to see these in person, but I think they're pretty cool. They have spring needles. And what the spring needles are, um, are needles with springs on them that combine the function of a darning spring on the needle itself. And it says on the Schmetz website that these needles are a dream for freehand machine embroidery or monogramming in a hoop without a foot. So if that's something that you do, you might want to check those needles out. I think I may have to order some of those just to take a look at them. Now, how often should you change your needle? Probably more than you have been. Conventional wisdom says that you should change your needle after every eight hours of sewing or every time you start a new project. I like to listen to what my needle sounds like going into the fabric. And if I start to hear a needle go thunk, 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 it's a very distinctive sound. I will stop and change my needle. Needles are not expensive, all things considered. So there's no point in using a needle well past its uh, shelf life or well past its integrity. And if you start to get skipped stitches or shredding thread or any other problem, stop and change your needle. It will fix probably 75% of the problems that you have with your sewing if you just use the right needle and change it frequently. One other thing that I'd like to note about the Schmetz needles is that they have a really cool color coding system. The color coding system tells you not only what the needle type is, but what size it is. And I've got a very handy luggage tag that we were given in our class last year at Sew Expo. 
that's got a key to the different needles based on their coloring. So the way Schmitz has done this is each needle has two bands on the shoulder portion of the needle. The upper band is color coded and tells you the needle type. The lower band is color coded and tells you the needle size. Jersey needles, for example, the color code for those is orange. Um, for a Microtex needle, the color code is purple. And then for the sizes, um, each different size has a different color. There is a very handy Schmetz needle guide in PDF format on the needle on the Schmetz website and you can go there and download it and print it out and I would suggest doing that and laminating it and keeping it near your sewing machine. You can get a needle keeper to uh, hold needles that maybe you've only used for an hour or two but having that color coding system on the Schmetz needles is also helpful because um, if you happen to forget to put the needle in the needle minder, you can still look at the color coding system and figure out what kind and what size needle it is. So hopefully you found this information helpful. Focused mostly on domestic machines here. If anyone is interested in something similar for industrial machines, I'd be happy to do that. Um, I just don't know as much about industrial sewing machine needles because I don't have as much experience in that area um, and they are a little bit different, especially trying to match needle sizes to thread sizes. That takes a little bit of getting used to because the thread sizing systems for industrial machines are much different than that for domestic machines. So if, if you want me to research that and talk about it, I would be happy to. Okay, I can't think of anything else to say about needles other than please change them frequently. They're not that expensive. Your sewing machine will thank you. Your sewing will look better. Show notes for each podcast episode can be found at the podcast website, which is now at thestraightstitchpodcast.com. You can also get there by going to my website, janetzabo.com. There's a link on the landing page for the podcast and for Big Sky Knitting Designs, which is the home of my pattern company from the years when I was a knitting designer and published knitting patterns. And I also keep my blog at janetzabo.com and that's where I have pictures of my current sewing projects. I talk about what's going on in my life and uh, that tends to include a bit more than I would include here on the podcast just because I talk about things that are happening in my community and in my life that don't necessarily have to do with sewing. But I'd love it if you joined us over there. I'd also love it if you would leave a review on Apple iTunes or Apple Podcasts. Next week's show, I believe, is going to be an interview show. So until then, I hope you have a great week and you get to go sew something.